Puji Mursang, the stage is yours, please. Thank you, Daniel. Um, first of all, I must um, thank Fajal and his colleagues at Tax Prime to invite me to give you a speech this morning in front of you. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here. Um, my speech is on what's currently happening in Japan after BEPS. Um, of course, John and Ahmed just uh, explained about BEPS project. So, my although my first slide um, slide right this slide is on uh, BEPS project. I will explain just briefly on what's BEPS. Um, BEPS, of course, is abbreviation for base erosion and profit shifting, what it means is simply tax evasion. So you better be careful when you talk about BEPS. Some of my clients tell me that they are working on BEPS. It sounds as if they are working on tax evasion. It's not just simple um, every tax evasion, but it means, as you can see on the slide, uh, it's tax evasion um, on schemes based on legal formalities not much in with economic substances. So for example, you might say, or some multinational companies say that certain intangible property is legally owned by this company set up in a low tax jurisdiction. However, virtually, maybe this intangible property is owned and maintained and maybe developed by another company within the group that's located in probably high tax jurisdiction. And OECD estimated around 100 to 140 billion tax losses annually based on such schemes. And finally, in 2013, OECD and G20 came up with the idea of having countermeasure for such tax evasion, and they called it BEPS project. And of course, uh, Indonesia is the member of G20, and Japan is member of both OECD and G20. So they were very enthusiastic um, to participate for BEPS project. And even non-member countries, non-OECD and non-G20 member countries also participated. And BEPS project is composed of 15 action items as how it was explained by John this morning. So I'm not gonna go into too much in detail about these 15 action items, but it's mostly on definitions or interpretation of the, um, the wordings such as intangible and other rules. And it also encouraged international cooperation of the various governments. Um, if you can take a look at the next slide. It is about what's happening in Japan after BEPS. Um, BEPS generally focused on intangible property issues, service transactions and financial transactions and restructurings conducted by multinational companies. In other, words, in other words, these are the factors used for the schemes that I explained in the first slide. So legal formality versus gamic substances. 
um, through BIPS project. In many countries, documentations are required. And therefore, more and more background information will be provided to the government beforehand, before they come in for an audit. So by the time tax authority come in for an audit, they know about your country, uh, company very well. A lot more information than before BEPS project. So based on those background information provided through master files, local files, and country by country reporting, they will be reviewing your international transaction with affiliated companies. So what I would like to say is that rationale will be more important than what it used to be. So no more within the range argument. Until just a few years ago, maybe before BIPs, many of the multinational companies, when they had an audit, they insisted they have no problem with their international transaction with affiliated companies because their profitability level is within the statistical range. As Ahmed just explained in his speech, in fact, I thought it was a very good speech that he made, um, ex ante is very important. You must have the right mechanism, precise mechanism for your pricing. And when you talk about pricing mechanism, segmentation is important because if you, um, if it's different segment, you should have different policies, different uh, background, and different business models. Your pricing mechanism must be consistent with your business model. So allocation factors are uh, something that's currently discussed by Japanese tax authority in many of the audit cases. And I, I understand same thing is happening in Indonesia. Um, some of my client in Indonesia are discussing with the Indonesian tax authority on segmentation. So segmentation and mechanism will be more and more important after BEPS. And it's the same in both countries, Japan and Indonesia. It should not be result oriented. Um, hard to value intangibles. Like I told you, BEPS project focused on intangibles. And the Japanese government has decided to adopt another suggestion from the OECD, which is on hard to value intangibles. And they will be officially adopting discount cash flow approach for valuation for intangible properties. Now, under the suggestion by OECD, if there is hard to value intangible properties that was either acquired or provided to your affiliated company, and if there are 20% differences after the transaction, then it could be revisited. In other words, when you apply discount cash flow approach, you will be using forecast of how much profit this intangible property will bring to your company. And in general, the sum of the forecasted profit is the value of the intangible property. But it is just a forecast that the calculation is based on. And therefore, OEC suggested if there are differences between actual and forecast, and the differences are more than 20%, then 
they might be able to revisit the valuation and maybe they assess on the differences. So that's going to be a challenging issue for many of the multinational companies because future is something that you would never know until it comes. And it might just happen based on unexpected event that 20% difference would occur. But OECD and Japanese government are not saying that they would make assessment whenever there are differences of over or more uh, than 20%. If you should have known that such a difference would occur when the transaction takes place, then the calculation was wrong. If the differences occurred based on some unexpected event which nobody could have understood, then you're fine. So you should really understand what's said under BIPs and what's said under the Japanese regulations. Another issue based on BIPs project is that, as I told you, BIPs project encouraged participated country to cooperate more. So there are information ex exchange encouraged by the uh, Barish government. Until just a few years ago, Japanese government exchanged information with other countries on tax issues, um, maybe about 200 total, uh, giving and received total. But last year, June 2018, Japanese government received 473 information from the foreign government on tax issues. And they have provided 415 information by request. So it's more than doubled in just two or three years. And why doubled or more than doubled? Because it's encouraged by OECD. And besides these um, 400 received and 400 provided volunteer exchanges, there will also be automatic exchanges, which is already implemented. Uh, so some of the financial transaction information and CBCR, country by country information, are exchanged automatically by the Japanese government with uh, more than 60 countries, including Indonesia. And in fact, the volunteer information exchange are mostly with Asian countries for Japan. Not so much with European and American uh, countries, but mostly with Asian countries. Uh, now, next slide, I'll be discussing about uh, dispute resolution procedures expected by OECD and G20. Um, OECD, under BEPS project, they've encouraged mutual assistance procedure and APA. As far as dispute resolution concerns, OECD believes that MAP or mutual assistance procedure could be very effective countermeasure. So on BIPs Action 14, they discuss about MAP procedure. Um, last year, that's ended June 2018, in Japan, uh, over 200 cases were filed by multinational taxpayers. In fact, mostly bilateral APAs. But there were 40 dispute cases. 
And among all these 40 dispute cases, 37 were transfer pricing. So from this statistical data, you can tell that most international taxation issues are transfer pricing. And 166 cases were settled last year between Japanese government and foreign government. And Japanese government has treaties with over 60 countries. And in these 60 countries, Japanese government applies mutual assistance procedures. On average, uh, around 30 months to be settled. And this is based on, again, uh, the statistical data from 2018. Um, but you should be careful about non-OECD member countries. Based on the statistical data, you can tell that it takes 10 months more to settle a case with non-OECD countries, like China. Um, I have seen quite a lot of cases uh, that Japanese government have, is having problems or issues with Chinese government. And it takes longer time than, say, uh, discussions with US government to settle a case with Chinese government. OECD is pretty much satisfied with how Japanese government is carrying out the MAP procedure. Um, they had such thing as pure review, and they had a report uh, based on the monitoring made to the Japanese MAP procedure. As I said, they were generally satisfied OECD had four minimum standard, uh, prevailing dispute, accessibility to MAP, resolution of MAP, and implementation of MAP agreements. From all four aspects, the OECD report said that they are pretty much satisfied. So I would say that MAP procedure is one of the realistic and practical countermeasure uh, to resolve your international taxation issues. Now, if you can take a look at the next slide, uh, it's, a, it's about documentation and TNMM. Um, Japan as how it is in Indonesia, also adopted BEPS action, not 14, but 13, three-tiered documentations. Local file, master file, and CBCR. Um, as far as country by country, CBCR reporting and master file concerns, it is almost identical as how it was suggested by OECD under BEPS project. But you should bear in your mind that local file in Japan is quite different from what was suggested by OECD under BEPS project. Um, what you are seeing on the slide is summary of the Japanese local file documentation. In essence, it's the same as what was suggested by OECD. But the wordings and orders are very different. Japanese local file is divided into two sections. The first item carries out, uh, carries background information. And what's most important in section one or item one is E. It's the mechanism, 
this is where you have to explain the mechanism of your transfer pricing. And as how Ahmad emphasized, it must be ex ante, not result oriented. And you really have to be um, careful about having mechanism that's consistent with background information contained in other parts of item one. And item two is the calculation based on E of item one. So both item one and two, which is calculation, must be consistent to each other. Now, uh, the next slide is on TNMM. TNMM is acceptable by the Japanese tax authority. In fact, approximately 62% of the map cases settled last year were based on TNMM approach. Um, the Japanese government used to oppose to TNMM approach. They simply thought it, that the statistical data can't decide anything. But after, four, after several years, they came to the conclusion that maybe TNMM is one of the practical approaches. So again, um, in many of the map cases, TNMM are used. And even in audit, um, Japanese examiners do accept TNMM approach. But one thing that you should be careful about is TNMM should not be applied whole country, I mean whole company basis. It should be applied by sector not by each one of the daily transactions, but by segment. When I say segment, um, as you can see on the slide, the Japanese government understand that if there are a series of similar transactions within the same year with same counterpart, that's one segment. So you can apply one TNMM to one segment. Another aspect that you should bear in your mind, and this is very, very important when you apply TNNM in Japan, it's the statement made by the Japanese government back in 2011. This is very important statement. Um, the Japanese government basically said that the interquartile range is not acceptable as a pricing policy. What they are trying to say is, again, as how uh, Ahmad explained, it must be ex ante, not like US approach. Many of the American multinational companies in Japan claims that their pricing policy is at the arm's length because the outcome is within the range. It's not ex ante, as how Ahmad explained. And that's what the Japanese government wanted to emphasize back in 2011. This is even before BEPS project. So you must, again, come up with precise pricing mechanism that's consistent with your business model. And instead of using interquartile range, they prefer, the Japanese government prefers pinpoint target that's applied to forecast. Or if not pinpoint, narrow range is expected. And interquartile could also be used as 
a sanity check purposes to monitor the pricing policy that's applied. Finally, on the next slide, I'll be talking about dispute resolution procedures in Japan. Like how it is in most countries, there are two kinds of procedures in Japan, domestic procedures and international procedures. And before I talk about the procedures, I would like to talk about uh, the uniqueness of the transfer pricing regime in Japan. In fact, transfer pricing regime could be divided into two factors under the Japanese taxation regimes. One, of course, is transfer pricing. The another is donation. Um, transfer pricing is the matter of balance of what you give and what you get. Whereas donation, as you can see on the slide, is not the matter of balance between what you give and what you get. It is rather defined as economic benefit without return. Under the Japanese donation taxation regime, unless you have appropriate return for what you give, it won't be deducted. And it sounds almost like transfer pricing. And in most countries, it is considered, donation is considered as transfer pricing. But in case of Japan, um, it could be divided into transfer pricing and donation. It is not just the conceptual differences that matters, and it's connected to what I'm going to talk about now, the relief procedures. If certain transactions are considered as donation issue, you can no longer take it to MAP procedures. Why? Because donation is not considered as double taxation. If it's considered as transfer pricing, as I said, it's a balanced matter. It's double taxation. But when it comes to donation, it is no, not an argument about balance. It's just one-sided argument that you, as a taxpayer, gave something to your affiliate, and that's it. You didn't get anything. So it's not double taxation matter. And therefore, you can't, in principle, you can't take it to MAP procedures. There are cases where we've negotiated, I negotiated, and took donation case to MAP, but it's very rare. So when you talk about transfer pricing issues with Japanese affiliated companies of yours, you should confirm whether the Japanese government considers the issue as transfer pricing or donation. Now about procedures. As I mentioned earlier, there are, like other countries, two kind of relief procedures in Japan. One is domestic and one is international. And domestic procedures, as you can see on this slide, could be divided into three approaches. One is objection or re-examination as how it's called in Japan. And if you are not satisfied with the result of re-examination, you can take the case to administrative review, which is uh, Indonesian equivalent of appeals. And if you're not satisfied with both re-examination and administration review result, you can finally take it to uh, litigation. But the problem with the domestic 
resolutions is that whatever the approach you take, very low winning rate of the taxpayers. So for re-examination, complete take back by the government is back in 2018 was only 2.3%. 2 uh, when it comes to administrative review, the appeals process, it was only 2.2% complete win of the taxpayer. And even litigation, 5.2% complete win by the taxpayer. So as far as the statistical data concerns, maybe it's not too wise for taxpayer to take their cases to domestic procedures. So from practical point of view, I'd say if you are into international taxation issues with the government, you should be taking your case to MAP. Or if it's before the audit, maybe APA is most effective mean to solve the issues. Again, like I explained in uh, another slide, Japanese government is very, very active on MAP. And they already had a few cases with Indonesia. And they have quite a lot of cases with United States and also with China. And APA, again, as you saw on one of my slides, most of the map cases are on APA. So bilateral APA is also encouraged in Japan, and it in fact is one of the most effective way to resolve the issues. But one thing when you talk about APA, you should be careful is that unilateral APA is not encouraged by the Japanese government. So if you try to file unilateral APA in Japan, in fact, the um, government comes to you and say, ask you many reasons why you're not making it a bilateral. And they, in fact, encourage you to change it to bilateral. So um, this is the end of my speech. But what I would like to tell you as the last part of my speech is that wherever the country you're dealing with, you should understand the situation or the enfor enforcement of that very government and develop your strategy to minimize your transfer pricing and international taxation issues. Thank you.